Our Father God, again, we come to you in this time and this moment and in this place. And Father, we open our hearts to you as we open our lives to you each and every day. And Father, we ask that you would speak to each and every one of us as your Holy Spirit would have free access to each and every heart. Father, let our hearts be opened like the cup that you would have for us to bring today, that it would be overflowing and filling over so that our heart would be filled, Father, that we might be blessed today, that we might be blessed today, that we might be a blessing tomorrow, and that everyone who sees us tomorrow, Father, will know that we have been with you. And Father God, be with us as we open your word, that you would gather us together as one, and that as one purpose and one plan, you would instill upon us, Father, the message that you would have for our hearts today as a church and as a people and as individuals. And Father God, we ask that you be with our brothers and sisters all over the world who do not share the freedom that we have today. What a blessing, Father, you have given us, that we can come together as a family and as a church and to worship together. Be with those brothers and sisters all over the world, Father, who are suffering in persecution. Who are suffering, Father, because their only crime is they love Jesus. Be with those who are put in jail and those who have hunted down and those who are in hiding right now. Oh, Father God, give them strength. Give them encouragement. And Father, help us to not forget what privilege you have given us that we might open your word in public and to share it among each other. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. I forgot to announce as I was speaking that uh, uh, Danny uh, Reese Evans had had surgery. But she had had her uh, wisdom teeth taken out. Now, I don't know what that's like because the doctor told me my mouth was big enough for all my teeth. Now, that wasn't meant to be funny. But uh, she's having some complications, so please pray for her that she's going to the dentist today. Let's turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 41. You know, one of the things that has always fascinated me is God's timing. What has always been a, a, a mystery to me is how God's word can be presented in God's time and in God's place to God's person. Why would God pick this portion of scripture today and have you be here today? And I believe that God has a message for all of us. I believe God has a message for me personally. And I believe God has a message for people who should have been here this morning. I look and see the places that are empty in our pews, and there are many pews in all churches around this area that are empty. And I look upon these places, and I think there is somebody who should have been sitting there that this message is directly for. And I believe that God brought a message for today with a particular scripture for today, that a person who is either here today or should have been here today, but God had made an appointment for you and for them, and here you are, and they are not here. And the question is why? I understand the circumstances of life. But you know what? I think, what if? See, this message is for, the story about this message is for Joseph. This whole chapter we're going to see is about Joseph. What if Joseph would have said one day, you know, I'm tired of this prison. I'm tired of being away from home. I have been away from home for 12 long years. And I want to go home. And so I'm going to run away from this prison. He was given some very unique privileges as a prisoner. He probably could have escaped if he had wanted to. Maybe you say, well, his fear of being caught and brought back or being caught and killed kept him from going. But you see, in reality, if Joseph would not have been there, he would have missed the blessing that God 
had planned for him. And I believe in our world today that there are many people that have said, God, where are you? God, I'm expecting your answer. God, I'm asking this question. I've been asking it for years. Why haven't you answered? And God said, I did, but you weren't there. Think about that. What if Joseph would have said, no, I'm not going to be there. You see, nothing, nothing, nothing supersedes the word of God. Nothing supersedes the preaching and the teaching of God's word. And I believe there are times when, when Satan has misdirected people and taken them different directions so that they wouldn't hear exactly what they were needing to hear today. Today we're going to see Joseph forgotten, forsaken. We see him here in verse 1 of chapter 41. It says, and then it came to pass at the end of two full years. We see in this introduction the providential hand of God. Could you wait for two years for God's answer? Could you wait if you knew that God's intervention would come in two years? Could you wait? I was in the military for two years. I find that very unique. I felt like I was in prison. <laughs> I felt like I was forgotten. I was in a strange place, in a strange land with strange people. <laughs> but you know what? Two years seemed like an eternity, but yet it went so quickly. And in those two years, I learned many things, were taught many things. Many things came across my life that later on I used, and I saw the purpose of it. But I didn't see the purpose in the two years. I saw the purpose many years down the road. Joseph didn't see the purpose of the pit that his brothers threw him in. Joseph didn't see the purpose of his plight when he was sent to Potiphar. Joseph didn't see the purpose of God when he was put in prison. Joseph wasn't told at 18 years old, boy, you're going to go to Egypt and become prime minister. Joseph, all he knew was that he went from pit to Potiphar to prison. And he was in trouble. And he'd been forgotten. Two Long years in prison from the baker and the butler. But the Bible says here, and it came to pass. And this is the providential hand of God. Nothing happens by accident. It is not by accident that you are here today. It is not by accident that God's timing is that you and I would be in this place at this time for this portion of Scripture, you do understand, and I know Joseph understood, that our timing is not always God's timing. I, I'm like the person who prayed for, for patience. Lord, give me patience, and I want it now. <laughs> there are times, I, you know, I, just, I just want to take, God, why are we waiting here? You know, why are you being so slow in this matter? And you see, I don't understand all the ins and outs. I don't understand all the details that God understands in all of this. And neither do you, and neither did Joseph at this time. But you see, we must learn to trust God. We must learn to have faith in God, and we must learn to turn that faith into trust and rely upon his word. Joseph has just spent 12 long years in slavery and in prison. According to the Jewish commentaries, Joseph is now 30 years old. Do you realize the significance between 18 and 30? Do you realize all what happened in your life between 18 and 30? Between 18 and 30, it was a li between 30, it was a lifetime. I can't tell you how many times I look back on my 18 to 30 and said, that was somebody else's life. 
It was like somebody else lived that life. Sometimes it's like a faded memory. I see pictures. I say, who is that? I look in the, in the mirror now and I say, I've come to the, accept the fact that my dad is now alive living in me. And whoever that was when he was in his 18th or 30, he certainly isn't doing what he used to do. <laughs> Joseph must have thought, here I am, 30 years old. Those 18-year-olds' life is gone. 20s are gone. Now in my 30s. I hated turning 30. I loved my 20s. I loved everything about my 20s. It was an exciting life. Man, we had everything was exciting. Everything was B.C., before children. <laughs> we traveled all over the world. We went through college. We went everywhere, new job, everything was exciting. And then she said, I'm pregnant. And our life changed. It was like we were in prison. <laughs> <laughs> and that was somebody else's life between 18 and 30. Jacob is now 120. Can't imagine what that would be like. Isaac is now 180. Joseph is lost, thought dead, ever, gone forever. He's in prison, gone forever in the minds of Isaac and Jacob. Isaac is just about ready to die. He is very near death at this point in his life. He doesn't realize, he's probably expecting it, but he's not realizing that soon he'll be gone. Life happens so quickly that we look back and say, what has happened? We're going to see in our text today the declaration of God's revelation. God has a revelation in the life of men and women. God has a declaration of revelation in your life. God is going to have a disclosure of God's representative. God's going to use Joseph in a mighty way. God's going to use you one day in a mighty way. You say, well, I'm not going to be vice president. I'm not going to be some great prime minister. No, you know what? Those things don't matter over the years. You see, Joseph's not going to walk around heaven and say, you know, I used to be prime minister of Egypt. Joseph's going to say, look, I was used by God to save my family. I was used by God to picture Jesus in my life. That's going to be Joseph's claim to fame. And you see, we're not going to get into heaven saying, I was the president, I was the CEO, I was this person, I was this person. We're going to go before the Lord and we're going to hear people say as we walk around heaven, you know, I was privileged to live my life for Jesus. You see, Joseph was in prison, but he didn't realize it yet that that prison experience was for the glory of God. We see Joseph coming of age, so to speak. Starting with the last part of verse 1, the Bible says that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine looking and fat. And they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came, upon, came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows, so Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then, behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them, and the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all his wise men. And Pharaoh told him his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. We see the declaration of God's revelation. God brings to Pharaoh the revelation of something important coming on the scene. And Pharaoh has a problem, doesn't he? 
he doesn't know the meaning. We see in verses 1 through 7, Pharaoh's disruptive dreams. You ever had one of those dreams? Now, I tell you, I, I've turned my dreams into opportunities. If I dream about you or I dream about somebody else that I know, I always pray for them. And so I use my dreams. If I remember in the morning, if I dream about you, I don't care how silly or how unique or whatever it is, I will pray for that individual. Sometimes it's people I've never met. I've seen them on TV, perhaps officials or somebody like that, and I'll pray for them. To me, that is God saying, you need to pray for that person. So I do. The, the, what happens during that time is insignificant. Praying for that person is. But we see here that Pharaoh has this strange and disruptive dream. His dream, first of all, is about cattle. Now, what's this got to do with Joseph? Joseph has been forsaken by family. He's been forsaken by a female. He's been forsaken by friends. And what's going to happen to Joseph now? Joseph is in prison. But God remembers Joseph. And when God remembers Joseph, the Bible says, rather than going to the baker, rather than going to the butler, rather than going to the woman, rather than going to the family, he cuts all areas and goes straight to the king. The one who can do something about Joseph's life. You see, all this is God's purpose and plan. Ann Ortland wrote a book many years ago. Every time I recommend a book, so don't go out and try to find it because it's probably discontinued, out of print, all that good stuff. Ann Ortland wrote a book called Up With Worship, and I've used this illustration before. Ann Ortland said, life is like a little boy watching a parade. At first, he can't get around the crowd, so he goes behind the big fence, and the fence hides the crowd, but he finds a knot hole in the fence, and so he views the parade through the knot hole in the fence. And sometimes, as he's looking through that knot hole, he sees the lions, and they scare him, and he sees the clowns, and they make him happy, and he goes from one emotion to another and we see all the different floats and all the different parts of the parade and suddenly there's a gap between the float and he thinks the parade's over with but it's not and so he has mixed emotions but a man sees the little boy looking at the parade through the knot hole in the fence and he lifts the little boy up so that he is above the fence and he sees indeed there are gaps between the floats and there are lions and there are clowns and there's good and there's bad and there's indifferent all within the parade, and the little boy gets an understanding of it. And then eventually the man says, let's go to the top of the roof over here. And he goes up to the top of the roof, and the little boy sees the whole parade from beginning to end. And it has a theme, and it has a purpose, and it has all those things. Ann Ortland said that life is like viewing a parade through a knot hole in the fence, in that before we met Jesus, we saw life through a knot hole. We had no, no understanding of it. There was no purpose in it. There was parts missing. Things scared us. Things made us happy. But we were never, never fully satisfied. Until Jesus comes in our life and he lifts us above our circumstances. And yes, there are tragedies in our life. But there is great joy and there's great peace. Sometimes it looks like the parade's over when in reality it's not. And then one day, she says, that the man will take us, Jesus will take us to heaven. And as we look upon our life, we're going to see the purpose of it all. We'll see the meaning of it all. We'll see it had a theme. It had a purpose. We had a reason for being here. Our inner connection and all how we touch the lives of others had a purpose and a plan. And Jesus said, that's why you were here. That's why you came. And suddenly one day, we'll know it all. But until that time, Joseph is languishing in prison for two years, forgotten and forsaken. Not realizing just around the corner he's going to be prime minister. Life is that way. We see his dream about the cattle in verses 1 and 2. We see there are robust cattle. A delightsome dream for Pharaoh. Suddenly he sees the Nile River. This is the only river he's going to be seeing. The Nile River, and the Nile River, the cattle are always in the Nile because number, there are two, well, basically three reasons why the cattle are in the water. Number one, the cattle like to be cool. It's hot in Egypt. There's a desert area there in Egypt. 
And so the cattle will go into the water in the Nile to remain cool. And then there are 10 billion, billion, billion flies in Egypt. You can't get away from them. They're everywhere. They're in the houses. They're in the shops. I've been there. I know. It's unbelievable. And so the cows would go into the water to get away from the flies. And the third reason why the cattle get into the water is easily explained by the, the term the circle of life. The crocodiles have to eat too. And so the, it was not unusual for the Pharaoh to see the cattle in the water. Oh, the Nile River was, was a sacred river to them. And cattle were sacred to them also. It was Osiris who was the, the great keeper of the netherworld, the underworld, who basically was seen as a bull in the animal form, and he was always seen with seven cattle. And so Pharaoh is getting a dream, and he's saying, man, this is just exactly like the, the Book of the Dead, which I have read ever since I was a child, and this is a great thing, I, I, this is an exciting thing, but suddenly his dream turns. You ever have one of those? There's your mom, and you, and you go and, and pat her on the back, and she turns around, and it's like a horror movie. Who is this? Pharaoh suddenly sees repulsive creatures in verse 3 and 4. Their his, his delightful dream turns to a disastrous dream, and suddenly there are zombie cows. <laughs> we see... Look at verse 3 and 4. You don't think they're zombies? Look at them. And behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, stood by the other cows on the bank of the river, and the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking fat cows, so Pharaoh awoke. Not only are they zombies, but they're cannibals too. Pharaoh is going berserk in his dream. What is going on here? Now, we're not going to talk about the interpretation yet. That comes for much later. But the bottom line is Pharaoh has had this weird dream. You ever woke up from a dream like this? You're in a sweat. You're thinking, oh, God, let me go back to sleep and dream something different. And have you ever done that and gone back to the same dream and told yourself, you got to wake up, idiot. You're in the same dream. <laughs> Pharaoh was so disturbed and so distracted here. This, you know, got to understand, it's not the baker or the, of the, or the butcher or the, or the candlestick maker that's got this dream. This is Pharaoh, folks. Now, when Pharaoh ain't happy, nobody's happy. You do understand that. So we got a problem here. And Pharaoh is upset. This dream had certainly religious considerations. The Nile, the bulls, the gods of mystery... Uh, or Cyrus, all of this stuff is taken into fact, and Pharaoh is absolutely confused. He is absolutely shaken in his sandals. We see in verses 5 through 7, he goes back to sleep. He wakes up, he goes back to sleep. He says, all right, I'll get another dream, this will be good, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have a good dream. Verse 5 through 7, we see his dreams about crops. We see the bountiful increase in verse 5. The Bible says, And he slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stock, plump and good. Now, if you got your King James Version, it says corn. I don't care if it's corn or grain. It doesn't matter to me. Okay, the bottom line is this is a good thing in verse, in verse uh, 5. Verse 6, then behold, seven thin heads blighted by the east wind sprang up after them, and the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads, so Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Zombie corn, who would have thought it? Pharaoh is absolutely stupefied. But you see, what Pharaoh doesn't get is this, these two dreams are one and the same. God is basically saying to Pharaoh, you didn't get it the first time. I'm going to give it to you the second time to make a point. Folks, when God deals with you many times, he deals with us in a repetitive manner. Okay? Just in case you didn't get it the first time. And this is a repetitive, different theme, but a repetitive uh, purpose for this dream. His dream about the crops. Verse 5, a bountiful increase. In verse 6 and 7, a bizarre incident. Who ever heard of corn eating corn or grain eating grain? We see that the wind's coming in verse 6 and 7. Do you see this? 
the Bible says, and the east wind sprang up after them. Why is that important? Well, the winds normally in Egypt, because of the River Nile, the River Nile flows from the south to the north. The winds usually came from the north, from the Mediterranean, or from the south coming up the river. And that was a good thing. It's just like when we get different directions from our, our weather, we can tell from different things happening. But on the east and the west of Egypt, when the wind came from there, that was a bad thing. That's why the dream purposely showed the wind coming from the east because when it came from the east, it came from the Saudi Arabian Peninsula across from the Sinai and literally into the desert area and bringing those desert winds. Out of the west, it came out of the Sahara Desert and literally brought drought into the land of Egypt. Just like if we're gonna, when you're in Florida, you learn there are hurricanes, they begin in Africa. They come all the way across the Atlantic come up through Mr. Castro's area and right up into either the Gulf of Mexico for the Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas folks, or it comes back into the, uh, the people with uh, Florida. Now, folks, that's called projecting weather, and, and that's exactly what God had done here. This is an east wind. It means a drought is coming. Pharaoh is thinking, what is going on? He cannot separate the truth from the fiction the truth from the symbolism. He's just not putting it together. God has given him the message. Sometimes, folks, if you pull away the bizarre aspects of, of what's going on in our life, we'll find the kernel of truth, will we not? Many times God directs us in his word, and if we listen to it and look at it, not necessarily in a symbolic manner, but in a practical manner, we will get the meaning of it. God will speak to us through his word. Now, I don't, you know, dreams can be changed. Dreams can be affected by many things. It can be the pizza you had the night before, you know. It, dreams can be really bizarre, but if you look and you pull it all apart, you might find a kernel of truth in this. We see his disruptive dreams. Once again, dreams have come to be a part of the God's holy writ. Once again, dreams are going to be coming into the life of Joseph. You think Joseph, by this time, went and told his brother about two dreams. They hated him for it. They threw him in a pit. The two people came from the Pharaoh's household, the baker and the butler. They brought two dreams also. Hey, you know, remember me, forgotten for two years. Hey, Pharaoh's had two dreams. He wants you to come and interpret them. Not me, I'm sick, I'm not going anywhere, right? Joseph, again, is going to understand. He's been prepared for this purpose, folks. Everything is coming for a purpose. Everything in your life is coming for a purpose. What purpose is it? You may not know it today. You may not know it till 12 years from now. You may not know it for 20 years from now. We may not know the truth till we get to heaven one day and find out, God, why did you allow that come into my life? And God says, for this purpose, that your whole family would be saved. Joseph went through what he went through because his whole family needed to be saved. The lineage of the seed blessing all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse uh, 15 was literally at stake because the children of Israel were going to die in famine. And God said, I'm going to use Joseph to rescue them and save them from utter disaster. Now, preacher, if God would have said that in the beginning, it would have been a whole lot easier. Okay, okay, God says, this is what we're going to go through. You're going to go through this, you're going to go through this, you're going to go through this, you're going to go through this. And this is for this purpose. You're going to say, wait a minute, can I just skip all of that and go to this? You're going to start bargaining with God. So God holds it back. He doesn't tell you everything you're going through and what purpose it all had. He will give you the meaning later. Sometimes it's much later. Joseph here is going through a time of trial. We see in verse 8, Pharaoh's disturbing distress. We see his agitated frustration. The Bible says in verse 8, his spirit was troubled. You ever woke up from a dream troubled? I have. 
I've woke up in dreams where I've been chased. Oh, man, I hate those dreams. I'm out of breath when I wake up. It's like the old joke the guy says, man, I was dreaming last night. I was eating marshmallows. I woke up this morning, my pillow was gone. <laughs> you know, we don't know why. You wonder, you wake up, you're troubled, you're agitated. Sometimes I wake up and I'm mad at my wife for what she did. And sometimes she wakes up and she's mad at me. You know, why? Well, I didn't do anything. I dreamed many years ago that she said to me, I'm pregnant. I thought, oh my gosh, I woke up, I was so upset and so angry. I thought, how in the world am I going to have a baby at this age? They can, dreams can affect you. Will you agree? Well, Pharaoh was affected. He, we see his awakened consideration. He woke and remembered his dream. Why? Because God had him to remember it. You ever forgotten a dream? You knew you dreamed, but you couldn't remember it. You can't do anything to get it back. You try to remember. Had a guy many years ago, write your dreams down. Put a notebook by your bed. Write your dreams down. They might be very interesting. You could use it perhaps when writing a book. Well, you know, you put that pad there and the paper there, and you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning, there's all kinds of stuff on it, but it don't make any sense. Sometimes you forget. God wouldn't let him. We see his alarming condition. He realizes that this is a dream. He realizes this dream obviously has some significance to it, but God is troubling him. Sometimes God troubles you. Well, wait a minute. I thought God loved me. I thought God cared for me. I thought God really, really, really was on my side, preacher. Sometimes God troubles you. Sometimes God will place that thought in your heart and your mind that will trouble you, will let, literally get you in, in to a point where you're going to want to do something about it. Pharaoh could have gone back to sleep, forgot about the dreams, and, and Joseph would have languished in prison for the rest of his life. God said, nope, you're going to, you're going to remember this, Pharaoh, and it's going to bother you, and God troubled Pharaoh. We see here that Pharaoh was awakened and alarmed. Psalm 77, 3 says, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. You see, Pharaoh says, I this has got to be something from God. What's going on? We see his assembled factions and he sent and called for all the magicians and he called for his wise men. He called for his soothsayers. He called for his, his uh, fortune tellers. He called for everybody that could do anything they could do. He brought them all. And folks, when Pharaoh called, you went. I don't care what time of the day it was. I don't care where it was. You went. And so they all came. They were all assembled. He sent for his magicians, his men of Egypt religion and dark arts. Surely they'll be able to tell them. It's got to be about Osiris. It's got to be about me dying pretty soon. It's got to be about me becoming, you know, a god. And, and, you know, my pyramid isn't finished yet. What are we going to do, you know? Let's bring the magicians in. And then he summoned his magistrates, his men of, of secular wisdom and insight, his, his uh, grand viziers and all these people that did all his work for him and his, his overseers, and he brought them in. I'm sure that Potiphar was called in. All these people were brought in. And this would be to no avail. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had spoken to Pharaoh, and no pagan would be able to discern that. Folks, don't go to the world and ask them what God's will is for your life. Don't go to the world and expect the world to give you spiritual insight. Don't look at the world. Don't be upset when you watch the news and you see those things going on. And don't they get it? No, they don't. Folks, we are running headlong into Armageddon and the world doesn't know it. The world has no clue. You think Putin is in charge of his own life? Putin's strings being pulled by the God of this universe. Do you think the Arabs and all the Muslims of the world are in control of their own life? 
God's judgment is coming upon the world, and he uses people like this. Judgment is coming. Folks, it doesn't take an Einstein to see that things are happening. And I don't care how many times the John Kerry's and the, and the Clintons and all the people do all they can to try to change everything and make everything different. God's purpose is coming down the road, folks, and the end of times is coming soon, and lo and behold, the world doesn't get it. Don't expect CNN to tell you what's happening. Don't expect Fox News to tell you what's happening. I know Christians who believe Fox News is more important to them than their Bible. They know more about Fox News than their Bible. Folks, get into your word, read what's going on, and you'll know what's happening. Jesus said, don't be dismayed. These things have to happen. Don't be upset about this. Folks, be prepared. Pharaoh sent for the wrong people at first, didn't he? 1 Corinthians 3, 19-21 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Don't go to the world and expect spiritual answers. It won't happen. And then look at his aggravated futility in verse 8. The Bible says his disclosure of fear was there. No one. You see in verse 8, the latter part of it? But no one could interpret him for Pharaoh. His disappointment of failure was obvious. God had Pharaoh right where he wanted him. God had Pharaoh in the palms of his hands. Pharaoh was ready for Joseph. Can you imagine? The only hope you have is a convict who's been in prison for eight years. Let's call the convict in. Okay. <laughs> Here's the Pharaoh of the, of the world. He is the God of Egypt. And he's going to call in a convict from prison to tell him what this was. Pharaoh's in the time of desperation, folks. Pharaoh's willing at this point to do anything. God knows how to get people ready. God knows how to get people's hearts ready. Pharaoh was ready, and he's going to get your boss ready. He's going to get your neighbor ready. He's going to get your friends ready. He's going to get your family ready. He's going to get people ready to receive Christ, and you've got to be there to be able to prepare their hearts. God's already prepared their hearts. You just need to share the message. Folks, we are in the time of the fields white unto harvest, as Jesus called it. We just have to be available. We see his aggravated futility, much like today when leadership seeks answers from the world and not God. We've got leaders in our country that say they're Christians. Where do they go for the answers? I can tell you where they go to the ans- for the answers. They go to the wrong place. Well, there's separation of church and state. Try that one in the kingdom. Try that one with God. Next, we see the disclosure of God's representative very quickly. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Joseph was humbled, and he's remembered by God in verses 9 through 13. Look at the moving of a servant in verse 9 and 10. Remember Joseph back in verse 14 of chapter 40, he says, Now remember me when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. We see in verse 9 and 10, the Bible says, And then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. He says, I have forgotten my friend Joseph in prison. We see a forgotten promise. For two years have passed. We see a forgotten past. He'd forgotten about the jail time. He'd forgotten about his prison friend. But you see, two years had passed. Enough time was out of danger. Pharaoh was ready. The time was now. Joseph was to be remembered. Didn't have to be remembered two years before. Our timing is not God's timing. Look at verse 11 through 13. 
We see the memory of a situation. In verse 11, he says, I remember a troubling circumstance. We were put in prison. The butler and, 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 and the baker were put in prison in verse 11. And then we had a dream each and one night, and each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. And if you remember the story, one was to die, one was to live. In verse 12, we see a timely clarification. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, a servant of Pharaoh, I mean of Potiphar, and we told him, and he interpreted our dream for us, and to each man he interpreted according to his own dream. We see a timely clarification. Nothing is by accident. Nothing. Nothing is by accident. We see in verse 13 a truthful conclusion. He said, and whatever he told me happened. Look at verse 13. And it came to pass just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office and he hanged, and he hanged him. The bottom line is God's word is true, folks. You can bank on it. You can count on it. And it's going to happen. It's true. Jacob's God is truthful. Isaac's God is truthful. Abraham's God is truthful. And God told all three of those great patriarchs, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you. He told Jacob, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And Joseph has seen in this moment, in this time, the truth of that from the three patriarchs. And folks, I have seen all my life men and women who have passed through my life who have come and given me great counsel, whom God had never forgotten and never left and gave them great comfort in time of need. And I have seen that in their lives, and I know it's true today. And if I will just have faith in God and trust in Him, then I will have what I need to have, will I not? We see this troubling past. Look at verse 14 through 16. Joseph is finally recognized. In verse 14, Pharaoh, excuse me, God is going to promote Joseph in verse 14 and 15. Wait for the promotion of God, folks. Don't, don't, you don't have to play political games and, and all kinds of games with people to be promoted. God will promote you. In verse 14, Pharaoh, we see sins for his convict. <laughs> that always cracks me up. The Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. You better believe they did. And he shaved, changed his clothes, and came to Pharaoh. He became to look like an Egyptian. You didn't go before Pharaoh looking like a Hebrew. Pharaoh didn't want you to look like somebody else. He wanted you to look like Egypt, so he became like an Egyptian at this point. In verse 15, we see Pharaoh shared his concerns. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there's no one who can interpret it. Pharaoh says, I've had a dream. Joseph could have said, oh, oh I'm out of here. <laughs> Thanks for the bath. Thanks for the shave. I appreciate this, but I don't know nothing about no dreams. <laughs> I'm out of here. Look at verse 15. Pharaoh stated his convictions. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. God promotes Joseph. In verse 16, God is promoted by Joseph. Look at verse 16. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it's not in me. He excludes himself. It's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. I can't give you peace, Pharaoh. But I know who can. You see, Joseph exalts the true sovereign. How easy it would have been for Joseph to be taken in and and all of this and taking credit for it and say, oh yeah, I can take this for you. You know what's in it for me? Joseph doesn't enter into that whatsoever. And folks, listen, God does not ask us to take credit upon himself for ourselves because God will not share his glory with any man. Joseph said, I can't do it, but God can. In that aspect, he took upon the nature of John the Baptist who in John 3, 30 says, I must... He must increase and I must decrease. Here's a guy who's been in prison for eight some years and he could have said, man, I've got to get, I'll do anything to get out of here. What do you want me to say? But taking a chance, he said, nope, God must increase. Does God want to promote you? 
Some of you, God wants, well, not me. I don't want to be promoted. God wants to promote you. You know how you, God can promote you? You promote God first in your life. Faith and trust. Bel- faith is belief that God is. And trust is belief that God directs the aff- affairs of men for our good. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it's impossible to please him for He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, you have to believe that. You might be in the prison of this world right now. You might be forgotten. You might be forsaken. No one cares. No one knows. No one even thinks about you. Perhaps you're in a situation where you're the last person on the totem pole at work. You're the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. No one's ever going to know who you are, but God does. God knows who you are, and he'll promote you in his timing. He'll promote you in his schedule. If we will but promote him, he will promote us. Joseph said, I can't do this for you, Pharaoh, but I know someone who can. Folks, God's purpose in your life is to magnify him. In your life. You're at work, not because of your resume, not because of your connections, but because God put you there. You're there for a reason. You're there for a purpose. You said, I'm retired. You're there for a purpose, too. God's going to bring you across Pharaoh's lives, and you're going to be able to say, it's not me, but it's God who can give you the peace that you want. Whatever decision God has brought into your life, whatever circumstances you're going through, there is a purpose and a plan for God in your life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that not only you promoted Joseph, but oh, that Joseph promoted you. And Father, we know that in our times of sorrow and sadness, in times of distress, in times of frustration, there is a meaning, a purpose, and a direction through it all. Father God, I don't know the hearts of each individual here today, but I know, Father God, you had a purpose for this scripture, for this place, for these people. And I know, Father God, that it is you who places in the hearts of men and women the strength that we need and the uplifting that we need in the time that we need it. And Father, if there's anyone here that this is their day, let them see it today. Let them know it today. Let them understand it unequivocally, Father, that it is your will that their purpose in life be known to them now. And Father God, if it be the purpose of being saved, if it's the purpose of joining a church, if it is the purpose of praying for people, if it's the purpose for something in their life at work or at home or whatever, Father God, make it manifest in this time of decision. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.